All right, church, Mark chapter three is where we're going to, to be today. Mark chapter three, um, verses seven through 19. So someone told me this a long time ago and I gave it a shot. I think I made it like four or five days in and then I started running out of pennies. But did you know that if you started with one penny today, I think I've said this before, and you doubled the amount of pennies that you have every day, that by the end of the month, you will have over $5 million. If you start with one penny today and tomorrow you're like, I shall double you to two pennies. And then the next day, Tuesday, you were like, the two shall become four. And then Wednesday, the four become eight. And then the eight become 16. And the 16 become 32. And the 32 become 64. And the 64 become 128. And I'm done at that point, right? If you keep doubling it, by the end of one month, over $5 million. I was like, no way. So I grabbed a penny. I, I, I sat down. I remember as a kid, I sat down on my floor in my bedroom and I emptied out like my, my little coin thing. And I was like, I got like 20 pennies. I'm well on the way, right? So I started with the one. I felt really good about day two because I was already there. So day two comes along and I'm like, ha, ah, I got two pennies. And then I, I, you get to like the, I don't know, beyond a hundred something. You're like, dang it. This is kind of tough, right? But, but it's this idea of, of multiplication that you can start really small, but if you continue to, to multiply, it starts to add up really quickly. So let's take that from the illustration of pennies and let's talk about people. Um, the Google tells me that there's a rough, rough approximate 2.5 million in the greater Austin area. That's San Marcos up to Round Rock. Yeah, I, don't know, I didn't know the Google was including San Marcos in the greater Austin area, but apparently it is. So San Marcos to Round Rock and Pflugerville and Cedar Park, there's like 2.5 million people. So I asked the question, Corey, what would it take for us to reach the whole greater Austin with Jesus. Okay, I am not gonna run into 2.5 million. I'm an extreme extrovert, but I'm not gonna meet 2.5 million people and share Jesus with 2.5 million. But if I say in 2021, I'm gonna focus on one other person that I'm gonna invest my life in and, and seek to lead to Jesus and to know Jesus and to walk deeply with Jesus to the point where they are then reproducing themselves. So in 2021, we go from one to two. In 2022, the two of us, let's say me and Charlie, we're like, okay, we're going to reach one other person, each of us right? The two become four in 2022. In 2023, the four become eight. Did you know that within 29 years, that is most likely all of our lifetimes, all of the greater Austin area could know Jesus? Within 29 years. And that's just with me saying, you know what? One person a year, right? That's just me focusing on one person a year and then each of us focusing on one person a year. Like, I, I realize that the reality of us reaching the whole greater Austin area for Jesus, I, I understand reality, but the fact is that's pretty incredible. And then within four years after that, all of Texas and a good chunk of Oklahoma, because I don't think there's many people in Oklahoma, all of Texas and a good chunk of Oklahoma could know Jesus, and only a few years after that, the entire United States could know Jesus, and only a few years after that, the entire world could know Jesus. Because once you start multiplying, and there's faithfulness to be faithful with a little, you start to see this incredible multiplication take place. And so then I'm sitting here and I'm like, okay, we have a young church, well, how can, we, how can we increase the kingdom of God with our church? Is it going to be attracting big crowds here? We're about to see that Jesus completely goes the opposite direction of that technique. Or is it going to be, okay, what, there's 50 of us here, let's just ballpark it. What if we all focus on one person, one person that we're going to invest our lives in? Shoot, that 50 becomes 100 in a year, that 100 becomes 200 in two years, that 200 becomes four, like, are you tracking with me? What if we actually did that? And, and the good news is, that's what Jesus does. So we're actually following a good model. That's Jesus' strategy. 
Throughout the New Testament, when crowds start to gather, Jesus either runs away from them, he's like, give me a boat, I gotta get away from these people, right? He either takes off, or he says something wild, like you gotta eat my flesh and drink my blood, and people are like, whoa, 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 what? Like he does something where he, he whittles it down to those who are gonna be faithful. Because his strategy is not in attracting crowds, his method is investing in a few who will then go and multiply themselves into others who will multiply themselves into others who will multiply themselves into others. Jesus' plan for reaching the world is not massive crowds, it's investing in a few who will invest in a few and invest in a few. And that's our invitation. So Mark chapter three, this is where we start to see this. In verse seven, we'll read, read these few verses. We won't spend a whole lot of time here in seven through 12, but I, I do want to read them and then, and then make one point from it. Mark chapter three, verse seven, Jesus withdrew with his disciples to the sea and a great crowd followed from Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem and Idumea and from beyond the Jordan and from around Tyre and Sidon. Idumea, I don't know if that's how you pronounce it right, but I've told you this before. Pro tip, just say it confidently. No one else knows. And so they'll be like, oh, that's how you say it. Idumea, yep. When the great crowd heard all that he was doing, they came to him and he told his disciples, get a boat ready for me, boys, because of the crowd, lest they crush him. For he had healed many so that all who had diseases pressed around him to touch him. And whenever the unclean spirits saw him, they fell down before him and cried out, you are the son of God. And he strictly ordered them not to make him known. I mean, gosh, isn't it crazy to think that the demons have a greater theology than some of us? That's frightening, right? They knew who Jesus was. They were like, you are the Messiah, the son of God. Good gracious, like heaven forbid if, if we don't have the same theology as the demons. Whew, that, that frightened me this week. So I don't wanna spend much time here because in many ways we've already talked about this. This is, this is a recap. This is just further elaborating without all the detail of what Jesus is doing and what his purpose is here. Why is Jesus here? Was it just by accident? Right, was, was Jesus just created in the first century of, of a Jewish culture? No, Jesus has always existed as God. There's an intentional reason and plan for why he is here. Let me walk over here and grab my whiteboard. You know I like whiteboards. Charlie and I were joking about this because last time we tried to pull this out, it was quite dramatic. All right. Oh man, for real, Blake? I gotta, fl don't look, don't look. This is why people don't do things with live audiences. Because when it's all filmed, you just edit that out. But beep, edit. Okay, watch this. Y'all ready? Y'all haven't seen anything yet. It's a blank board. Boom. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. No, nope, thank you. Thank you, Mike. I appreciate that. Y'all seen this before. But this has, this has revolutionized my own understanding of God, which is probably why I talk about it a lot. God has always existed. Before the world began, God was. There was never a moment in eternity when God didn't exist. And God is a God of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is great news for us because God doesn't need us. God doesn't have to create us in order to feel loved. God the Father feels love from the Son and the Holy Spirit. God doesn't have to create us in order to give love. God the Father gives love to the Son, to the Holy Spirit, right? God is perfectly complete and happy in and of himself without us. He is the fullness of life. In his presence is the fullness of life because that's who God is. That's great news because then he can create us, not because he needs us, not because his glory is running low and he's like, gosh, I gotta create some people to give me glory. What am I gonna do if they don't praise me? Right, what am I gonna do if they don't love me? I'm gonna feel so lonely. He creates us so that we can share in the fullness of life with him. God is a God of generous love. And so he creates humanity to share in this with him, to walk with him, but we are incredibly selfish and egotistical, and we're like, God, thanks for your generous gift, but I would like to maybe have that and do my own thing, if that's okay. Can I have heaven and my own life and my own will and my own desires? And the Bible calls that sin, idolatry. 
putting anything at the same level as God. And we see that in Genesis 3 when, when Adam and Eve, they look at the, the fruit of the tree that God said, don't eat of that. And they're like, that looks really good to my eyes. God, I know you said not to, but I'm gonna go ahead and do this anyways. And that's called sin. And that separates us from the fullness of life with God because the last song we sang says God is holy. He cannot be in the presence of sin because if he's in the presence of sin, he's no longer holy. And so when we sin, we have to be separated from God. But God has a plan. In Mark chapter one, Jesus says, the time is fulfilled. The specific time is fulfilled. It says he came proclaiming the gospel of God and saying the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe in the gospel. There was a specific time when Jesus, in incredible selfless love for us, left heaven and came to earth to live the perfect life we were supposed to live. We messed it up, so Jesus said, I'll do it for them. And he comes, imagine taking a test. We're supposed to take a test with our life and give it to God, and it's supposed to be a hundred, perfect, holy. It's the only way we're going to be in his presence. Well, we've all failed. We've all at some point in our life from the youngest one chosen to go our own way. And so Jesus comes to do that for us, to live a perfect life for us. Well, then now what do we do with our record of sin? If I'm guilty against the law of Texas, then I have a record, I have a punishment I have to pay, whether it's a a fine or whether it's prison or probation or whatever, because of my guilt, there is a punishment I have to pay. So what do we do with our punishment against God? Jesus pays that for us on the cross. He suffers the punishment that we deserve on the cross. And then he rises from the dead and he returns to heaven so that he can create a way for us to be restored back into the fullness of life with God. We're created for this, we've walked away, so Jesus, at the appointed time, came to bring God's kingdom to earth so that we can be rejoined back into his presence and experience the fullness of life in his presence. That is why God came. And we know this when we trust in Christ and the more that we become like Jesus, we move closer and closer and closer and closer into his presence. And one day we're gonna be in heaven and all sin is gonna be gone and there won't be any obstacle to us knowing the fullness of life, but the incredible thing is we're never gonna hit the ceiling. God's just gonna get greater and greater and greater and greater for all of eternity. Because if we hit a ceiling, then it's like, oh, cool, I've risen to the ranks of God. But we'll never rise to his ranks. For all of eternity, this fullness of life will just increase. But we experience that more today when we trust in Jesus and become like him. The more that I put away myself and live like Jesus, the more that I know God and love God and enjoy the fullness of life that he created for me. And so that's why Jesus came, was to bring God's kingdom to earth. That's why he's casting out demons, to get rid of the, he's pushing out the darkness of the devil. That's why he brings healing, because sickness and brokenness is not of God's kingdom, it's of the kingdom of the devil. And so Jesus is going to bring healing because he's pushing out the darkness and bringing in the light of the kingdom of God. That's why he came to earth, was to do that for people. And so that's what he's doing in Mark chapter three, verses seven through 12. It's just more of Jesus bringing God's kingdom to earth. But it's not just for them. God's kingdom is for all people in all places and all times. Praise God that it's not just for Mark chapter three because if it is, you and I, man, we're just reading a history book. We don't actually get to participate. We don't actually get to know God. But God's plan is not just for Mark chapter three. It's for you and me today. It's for us to know him. God so loved the whole world. He loved every generation. He loves every race. He loves every gender. He loves every socioeconomic background. He loves every story. He loves every single person. And his desire is for all people to know him and trust him and follow him. 
So how is God's purpose going to be fulfilled? How, how is God going to make that possible for you and me? Right, put ourselves here. Okay, there's a few thousand year gap. How are you and me going to know Jesus? Is it gonna be Jesus standing up and preaching to masses and having everybody come to him? Because then he would still have to be alive today for that to be the case. We would have to be able to get to him for that to be the case. So how is Jesus going to expand his kingdom to all people, to all places, to you and to me? Verse 13, crowds are gathering, remember? There are crowds he, eating out of his hand, right? He's got the first mega church on the cusp of history waiting to explode, okay? Thousands of people are, people are traveling from 150 miles away. That's the furthest region mentioned here. On foot, I don't even want, I don't even want to try that. Like, I don't, somebody Google map that. How, what's 150 miles from here? Dallas? No, it's probably even closer than that. On foot, gosh, no way, I don't wanna walk that. So you got people walking over 150 miles to get to Jesus, right? Like, seems everything's coming together. What does he do? And he went up on the mountain and called to him those whom he desired, and they came to him. And he appointed 12, whom he also named apostles, sent ones, right? The ones that go first, so that they might be with him and he might send them out to preach and have authority to cast out demons. He appointed the 12, Simon, to whom he gave the name Peter, James, the son of Zebedee, and John, the brother of James, to whom he gave the Bonergers, that is, sons of thunder, Andrew, and Philip, and Bartholomew, and Matthew, and Thomas, and James, the son of Alphaeus, and Thaddeus, and Simon the Zealot, and Judas Iscariot, who betrayed him. Jesus has crowds coming to him. In, in our context, right, like he's got, I mean, he's got YouTube subscribers on top of YouTube subscribers on top of YouTube subscribers. He's got people all over the world tuning in to him, right? And what does Jesus do? He calls 12. He retreats from the crowds. He, he sinks back. He turns off his social media, right? He, he kills his massive following and he focuses on 12 in front of him. It's really easy, I think, for me to, to sit here and say, okay, we as a church have to grow. We have to grow. Healthy things grow. If, if my children stop growing here, they're not healthy, right? There's something wrong. Healthy things continue to grow until they've reached their fullness. So for us to be a healthy church, we, we have to grow. For us to be able to support ourselves, we have to grow up and be able to support ourselves so that we can then support others. And I'm like, okay, how do we do that? Man, do we just try to attract people and do things to get people to come here and try to make sure everybody likes it? Or do we take the lead of Jesus and say, we're gonna focus on a few who then if we're faithful to, to then multiply and focus on a few who then focus on a few, I think we'll be just fine. I think we'll be okay. And so I'm here to say that our strategy, whether we make it or not, is going to be to follow the lead of Jesus, and that's gonna to be to make disciples who then make disciples, who then make disciples, who then make disciples. And if God wants us to make it as a church, we'll make it, and if he doesn't, we won't. But that's what we're going to be about because that's what Jesus did. The crowds are coming and he brings in 12. And I love the 12 that he brings in. There's nothing fancy about these people. They don't have like a, a rich family legacy. They don't have a lot of money or power, right? Like they're not walking into town and people already know who they are. They're, they're, they're blue collar fishermen. They're, they're center tax collectors, right? Like you've got just a hodgepodge of people that Jesus calls to himself, which encourages me because I'm nothing special, right? I'm from Victoria, Texas. Everybody tends to know somebody from Victoria, but nobody, no one goes to Victoria, right? It's like, what do you do that you drive through there to get to Houston or Corpus, right? Like, you know, like, I, that encourages me. I feel like I could fit in with these guys. They're kind of dense and dumb at times. They're arrogant. You are like, when are you gonna get it? I'm like, whew, I'm glad they don't get it too, because I still struggle a lot. Mike says that to me every week at staff meeting. When are you gonna get it, Corey? <laughs> I'm like, I'm working on it, man. I'm, I'm like the disciples, okay? He doesn't really say that. He doesn't. Every other week, maybe. maybe. So, 
So Jesus calls 12 because his strategy is not in programs. We're never gonna be a church of a lot of programs. His strategy is not in sending out flyers everywhere and trying to attract crowds. Jesus actually retreated from the crowds. His strategy was to invest personally in people, trusting that they will then go and invest personally in people, and they will then go and invest personally in people. That's how real discipleship happens. Why does Jesus do that? God can do anything. He doesn't need us at all. Why does Jesus even call the 12? I mean, I guess if God wanted to like live on earth eternally and multiply himself all over the world, I guess he could do that. He's God, right? So why does Jesus call 12 people, one of which is gonna betray him, the other 11 who are pretty dense and at the time of his crucifixion are also gonna bail on him? Why does he, he do that? Why does he call us? Because the fullness of life is found when we trust in Jesus and model our lives after him. If we are never entrusted with the same mission that Jesus had, we can never be like him in that way, and thus we will never know him to the fullness that we can know him. God can do whatever he wants, but he entrusts us. He entrusts these 12 with the same responsibility so that we can be like him and know him and share with him in the process of making disciples and thus we can know him more and love him more and be like him more. And so he calls these 12 to him and look what they did. Stay in verse 13. He called to him those whom he desired and what happened? So, somebody tell it to me. What, what did they do? They, they came to him. Jesus was like, hey, come over here. And you know what they did? Hot dog, they went. Like they, they just straight up followed Jesus. They, they obeyed him. We've seen this when he calls the disciples that the primary mark of a true Christian, the primary mark of a disciple of Jesus is one that surrenders their own and follows Jesus. The primary mark of a Christian is not someone who's perfect, not someone who who has it all figured out, not someone who's super religious, but someone who is willing to lay their lives down and to follow Jesus, to surrender everything. Jesus makes the point multiple times throughout the New Testament. Matthew chapter six, he says, no one, that's gonna include me and you, no one can serve two masters. For either he will hate the one and love the other, or he will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and money. Jesus' focus is not just on money. That was the context of what he was talking about. Jesus' focus is you cannot hold tightly to God and tightly to something else at the same time and say that you love God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength. The only way we hold tightly to God is with both of our hands letting go of everything else. The only way I can follow Jesus out that door is if I'm also not trying to walk out that door. The true mark of a disciple, the way that you and I can know, am I truly a Christian, is are you willing to surrender everything that is in opposition to his will? Again, that doesn't mean that we have it all together. But when we are exposed, when we're exposed to, oh shoot, this isn't how God tells me to manage my money. Are you willing to let go of the way you've managed it and say, I surrender to your way. I'll follow your way. When God reveals to us and shows us in his word, oh, shoot, how how I'm exercising my sexuality is not God's, God's plan. Will you cut ties with how you've been practicing your sexuality and surrender it to the way of God? When God says, hey, you're not always right, so I need you to lay down your pride and to get the log out of your own eye first, will you humble your pride and submit to the will of God? When scripture says, let no, zero, not any, unwholesome talk come out of your mouth, but only that which is good for building others up, will you go, dadgummit, that's not wholesome. I will surrender, I will change my habits to the pattern of God. 
When God says whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it to the glory of God. And if you start looking at your food or your drink and you're going, that's not glorifying God, will you surrender that to the will of God? The mark of someone who's truly a Christian is not perfection, but is a willingness to surrender to Jesus. It's a life of ongoing confession and repentance. I'm gonna follow Jesus and yes, my brokenness is gonna pull me back here and the Holy Spirit's gonna say, what are you doing? Am I willing to surrender and return to him? Are you willing to surrender and return to him? Is there anything, and Charlie brought this up, we didn't sync up on this, is there anything that you're holding tightly to that's not the will of God? Because if you're unwilling to let it go, Jesus will say that you are not fit for the kingdom of God. Those are the words of Jesus. The true mark of a disciple is that at every point along the way, we're willing to surrender. Say, Jesus, you're my Lord. I screwed up again and I'm sorry. I repent. I surrender. That's why we take the Lord's Supper every week because I don't know about you, but I definitely sin every week. I need a reminder where I'm laying that down and receiving again the forgiveness that Jesus already paid for me. I need that practice. The mark of a disciple is that when he calls, I follow. When he says to do this, I'm willing to do it. We, we talked about this. Mike and I heard this illustration at, at a conference. He doesn't remember it, um, but I remember it. Um, it's okay, it's fine, don't worry about it. Um, of, of, of a guy giving the illustration, right? And, and I've said this before, Mark, we talked about it recently. It's, it's, it's a, a dad saying, hey, ch- children, niñalitos, go clean your room, right? And, and the kids go upstairs and then, and then, you know, some time passes and they come back down and the dad's like, my children, did you clean the room? And the children are like, oh my gosh, dad, I loved what you said. I wrote it down and I highlighted it and I drew a little heart next to it on my little sticky note. I put it on my mirror, clean your room. And I meditated on it and I memorized it. I called up my friend and I was like, you're not gonna believe what my father told me. He told me to clean my room. It's the most amazing thing he ever said. I can't believe it. Let's sing a song about it. Let's write a song and let's sing a song about what what my father told us to do. You know what? Bring your friends. Let's do a Bible study. Let's do a study around what, what the father told me to do because it's so incredible. Isn't that just the best news he told me to clean my room and then the kid comes downstairs and the father's like hey did you clean your room and they're like well no dad but I wrote a song about it and I did a bible study about it like I got the Greek in there and I was like parsing it out and I was like man what could he have meant like this and I really thought about it and I memorized it and I hid your word in my heart and the father's like no no but I I, I told you to cl- I told you to clean your room like what where were we, where's the breakdown here and yet we're going to take the word of our father and we're going to say Matthew 28 <clears throat> go therefore and make disciples of all nations baptizing them in the name of the father and the son and the holy spirit teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you and we're going to memorize it and we're going to talk about it and we're going to write books about it and we're going to sing songs about it and we're going to tell our friends about it but then when it actually comes time to doing it I don't know that conversation may go weird so I don't know that I want to do this um, or like, right, right and it's not just that and this is not a guilt trip gosh I, I will lead the way in sinner okay I, well, I promise you that we're, we'll be just fine this is just if we call ourselves disciples now is the right time to do the right thing and that means we're going to submit and surrender everything to Jesus okay Jesus if this is what you're saying we're going to do then we're going let's go let's do it that's the true mark of a disciple and so how then does Jesus make disciples of 2021? He called 12 who invested in a few, 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 who invested in us. Our spiritual lineage can somehow, some way point back to these. Jesus reaches the world because there were a few who were faithful to do what he said to do and praise God we're the recipients of that. 
There's a few everyday common people. And if you're looking at it, you're like, well, these are the apostles, right? Like, yeah, they were everyday common people then, but then they became the apostles. Well, if we go read Acts chapter 8, we see that the gospel went from Jerusalem to Judea to the Samaria, and the apostles stayed in Jerusalem. Ha, huh, look at that. The people that went to Judea and Samaria were not the apostles. They were unnamed, everyday, casual people. One of the most famous churches in all of history is the church in Antioch. And do you know who it says started that church? Some of them. Doesn't even name them. <laughs> Just some of them went to Antioch and they told people about Jesus and started a church. That's incredible. Yeah, God, God uses me and you. Like we're recipients of faithful men and women and now it's our turn to go be faithful men and women and to make disciples who will then make disciples who will then make disciples and generations from now by the grace of God we will have a spiritual legacy that follows well after our days but it's not going to happen by accident so what did Jesus do and, and I'll be shorter here. I, I'll, 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 I'm, I'm, I got you. What did Jesus do? He appointed 12, whom he also named apostles, so that they might be with him and he might send them out to preach and proclaim the gospel. Two things that he was going to do. He was going to bring them in to be with him and then he was gonna send them out to proclaim and demonstrate the gospel. He was gonna invite them in and spend time with them. The bulk of the New Testaments is Jesus with these 12. Man, they went to weddings together. together. They drank wine together. He was like, uh-oh, weddings out of wine. Turn some more water into wine, right? Like he, he celebrated with them. He ate with them. They walked together. They slept together. He did miracles together. They, they confronted the religious together. He answered their same questions over and over. He was like, hey, they're gonna, I'm gonna be sent over and I'm gonna be crucified and I'm gonna rise from the dead. And they're like, Jesus, which one of us is the greatest? I feel a lot like that though. Come on, right? Like, Whew, praise God for some dense disciples because it makes me feel a little bit more normal. He was just with them all the time. If we are going to follow the lead of Jesus, we have got to spend more time with people that we are discipling. We've got to spend more time with people that we are investing in. This will accomplish two things. One, it will let people see Jesus in us right? That it will let people learn how to respond graciously to poor customer service. It will let people see how to love and care for our waiter and tip well. It will let people see the hands and feet and the words of Jesus through us, right? It gives them something to follow. And then two, it removes them from their old bad habits and influences, Right, if I'm following Jesus and I've got someone who's spending a lot of time with me, that means they're not spending time with other people that were bad influences or other computer screens that are bad influences, right? It's, it's a numbers thing. It's, it's not there as much. But we've got to invite people into our lives. And this is one of the biggest differences in how we in America try to make disciples and how Jesus made disciples is we want to do it uh, with about two hours a week. And Jesus spent days with them. He just overlapped their lives together. But we're hoping maybe a Sunday morning and a discipleship group during the week will be enough. Let me read some numbers to you. 28 1635. 28 is the average number of hours per week spent watching TV in America. 28. 16 is the average number of hours per week on social media. 35 is the average number of hours per week at work. And yet we want to make disciples with, let's be generous and say six. 
right? Let's be generous with that. So the first challenge we're going to run into is we have to sacrifice our schedule and our calendar and start to bring people into our lives. I will be the first to say when I start to think about that, I freak out. Like I've got, I've got four kids and they want to do things with their lives. Like they don't want to just sit at home. I don't get it. So like, I need to go to cheer practice or I need to go to basketball or whatever. And that's, okay, so that's all great, right? And then I have a job and then I have, you know, uh, other responsibilities. And so I'm like, well, where am I going to fit this in? I don't fully know yet. I'll be honest. But I know that Jesus spent a lot of time with his disciples and we think we're going to get it done with a very small bit. And yet the influence is our people are more discipled by TV and social media than by the word of God. Hands down, landslide. And we wonder why we're not moving forward. Like it's, it's really not a tough one to grasp. We just, we just don't want to do it. Let's, let's be real honest with ourselves. We don't want to give up our TV or our social media or our fun times or whatever it is. We've got to spend more time with people overlapping our lives, eating together, working together, fixing a car together, um, mowing the lawn together, going to the grocery store together, playing baseball together, sharing the gospel together, reading the Bible together. We've got to spend more time together if we're going to see that happen. The second thing that we see Jesus do then is he sends people out. So another one of our problems is we get our groups and we spend a lot of time together and we get really comfortable and then we don't want to let anybody else in or we don't want to change that. We don't want to go meet new people because heaven forbid we mess up this dynamic and, and then what? Like I'm guilty of that too. I was just talking with someone earlier today and we were talking about our church and it's like I think we've gotten really comfortable with each other. I, I think that the core of us have gotten really comfortable. And that's nice, but God didn't create us to be comfortable. God created us to to change the world, to to know him and to change the world. And so that's gonna mean that we have to get outside of our comfort zones and go meet new people. We're going to have to send our friends out to go start new discipleship groups and community groups. We're gonna have to go do that ourselves. Or the 2.5 million in greater Austin will still be 2.497 2.497 million who don't know Jesus or whatever high number it actually is. Jesus sent them out. He told them in John 20, as the Father has sent me, so I send you. We are sent out. This is how Jesus was going to reach the world. And this is how Jesus was going to reach us. He invited a few in to trust and follow him. He spent a lot of time with them. And then he sent them out to go and do likewise. And then they invited people in, spent a lot of time with them, talked about Jesus, and then sent them out to go do likewise. And so on and so on and so on until we are the fortunate recipients of that. And now it's our turn to invite some people into our lives, share Jesus, share our lives, and then send them out to go and do with others as we continue the same. The question is, will we do it? Will we follow Jesus in this way? So I just want to finish um, by talking about how we at Austin Life are going to do this. So, decide, oh, Mike, that's on you, Mike. That's, that's on you. See, This is, again, why you don't have live audiences, because you just edit that out, everything's perfect. But then, where's the fun in that, you know? Like, that's no good. We good? You good? good. You're great? Yeah. You still hanging back here? Keep going. You good? Okay. Yeah. So, the primary way that we believe we can join Jesus in this mission is to follow his lead by investing in a few and then sending them back out. The way we do that is through discipleship groups. Um, if I had to pick... I can't do one thing. I think biblically we have to do two. Two things that we as a church did. Two things. It would be this gathering, because you can't read the Bible and say that doesn't exist, 
and discipleship groups. A few people investing deeply within one another who then go out and make more disciples and start new groups, who then go out and make more disciples and start new groups. So a discipleship group is a group of two, three, four, five-ish who are intentionally committed to being real with one another and helping one another grow in love and obedience to God. We're going to get real about life. We're not going to hide. We're not going to put everything out there and it's all nice and neat and pretty. Like, come on, we all know better than that. We're going to be real because Satan works in the shadows and as long as we keep shadows, he's going to destroy. So we're going to be real with each other. We're going to be honest and we're going to help each other actually love God more and be obedient to his word. Now here's what we tend to do. We tend to get together for our discipleship groups and look back and look up. Right? We talk about life, you know. We spend the first 15, 20 minutes or so, and we're like, how's life going? How's this going? You know, we, we celebrate the things that are going well. Um, we, we hopefully will confess the things that are not, where we're struggling, right? We, we look back. Man, we haven't seen each other in a week. Fill each other in, right? Like, let's talk. That's good. We look up. And you know, hopefully, we're, we're getting in the Word together. We're actually looking to God together. We're talking about our Bible study together. We're talking about our time in the Word together. I'll also admit, we're not the best at this. Like, I think we, we, we can get better here. But we've tended to done this pretty well. I don't think that was good English. We've tend, tend to done, no, that's not. But we're just gonna move on. Tend to have done, thank you, Laura. What we've, oh, that's not right. I already said that. Don't flip it, I'm just gonna erase it. Jesus is our eraser. He, no, no sorry, sorry, <laughs> sorry, sorry. No, I'm not going to go there. Yeah. Look ahead, forward, out. Thank you. I was like, why did I freeze there? We've not done that well. We've not taken intentional time to practice sharing the gospel with one another. Right? I can't, I'm sorry, guys. I can't think of a time where we sat down and said, all right. Blake, you're up. How would you communicate the gospel? And so we're never going to be fluent in that language when the time comes because we've never practiced that language, right? The way we learn a language is by speaking it, is by practicing it, is by immersing ourselves in it. But yet when it comes to communicating the gospel, we don't ever practice that. And so when the time comes, we don't know what to say. We freeze and we don't say anything. And so we're going to actually practice speaking the gospel with one another. We're going to mention the people that we are going to take next steps with and pray for them by name and encourage one another. And then next time we get together, we're gonna ask, hey, how did that go? How was your lunch, right? Oh, it didn't happen, why not? What happened? We're going to encourage each other. But the problem with so many discipleship groups and Christian organizations is that we don't move outward, right? We, we care for one another and we, we look up but then we don't actively take steps forward. And, and Mike and I have been grieved by our lack of equipping in that way. And, and, and so we want to say up front, we are sorry that we have not pushed us that way. We have not set us up well to live out in that way. And things are going to change. Again, whether this church makes it for the long haul or not, we're going to stand before the Lord one day and we're going to say, God, we didn't do it great at the front end, but we sure as heck gave it our best from this point forward. And I think God's gonna say, well done. Thank you for learning. And so our discipleship groups are going to shift from just focusing on these two things and we're going to include this. Okay, but that's still just one time a week. So we've got to add times where we're actively going out to share. Jesus sent them out and they went and they knocked on doors and they said, hey, we'd love to tell you about Jesus. Right? Super awkward. I know, uh, like right now, your anxiety may be increasing as we think about that. I get it. It's hard. But we're gonna have at least two times a month where we as a church say, all right, we are gathering up to practice this and to go. And if you can't make those times, we can do other times. But we are going to put this into practice Otherwise, we're not following the lead of Jesus. 
Otherwise, we're hoping to grow this church by gathering a crowd when Jesus, his strategy was investing in a few who sent them out to go and to share the gospel. As a discipleship group, so those of you in, in my discipleship groups just know that the change is coming. Lo- love you guys. We're going to hang out together more than one time a week. That says together. We're gonna eat together. We're gonna get our families together, right? Like we're going to, we're gonna demonstrate Jesus outside of the regularly scheduled times. We're gonna demonstrate Jesus in the day-to-day life. And I realize that's gonna call for some schedule adjustments. But again, I think, I think we've gotta to surrender to that. We've gotta be willing to make adjustments or the ceiling of our growth and effectiveness is really low. So I will say, we don't have it all figured out yet. We're still learning as we go, but this is a shift that we're wanting to take and we're asking you to take that with us. If you're not in a discipleship group, would you be willing to to get in one? If you're not in a discipleship group, as gently as I can say it, we're not following the model of Jesus. He brought in 12 and then within the 12, he actually had three that he invested in even more. He had his community group, so to say, and then his discipleship group within that. And so we would love to help you form one and get started. We really think it is for our own growth, but also the greatest way that we will reach those around us. I want to encourage you with that. If you're already in a discipleship group, we're we're working on more resources with this, and we'll we'll actually give some more that rolls out um, as soon as we're finished with it, but would you shift your discipleship groups to not just do this and not just do this, but will you include active practice and going, actively sharing the good news of Jesus with others, encouraging one another in that, helping one another in that? Would you plan now that that our discipleship group of three or four, man, it's not gonna be together in a year or two or three because we're we're going to reach new people and start new groups. We've gotta have that mindset in mind so that we can do what Christ did for us through the 12 and through the ones that followed after that. So when we read Mark 3, that's, that's what we envision. That's what we see Jesus doing, and that's what we want to do as well. For, for our good to know him, to be like him, and for the glory of God as the hope of Jesus spreads beyond just this room to our offices and neighborhoods and schools and teams and the world. That is our hope. And that's what we want to go out swinging for and trust God to do the rest. Let's pray. God, I'm, I'm grateful for your patience with me. Um, God, I must sound like a broken record a lot to you, um, and your patience is great. We're, we're all recipients of that patience. All of us, whether we know it or not, we're recipients of your patience and your kindness to us. God, Holy Spirit, would you speak and teach right now? It doesn't matter whether this sermon was great or not. We need to hear your voice. I'm asking you to make this passage, your words, come alive to us. That we would selflessly surrender all to you and trust you as we follow Build your church. Do with us as you see best for your glory, for our good, and the good of the city and the world.